Well, we're going to start a brand new series tonight that I think is going to be a fun series, and it's called New to Hebrew Roots. And tonight, we're just going to look at just one real small part of it. We're going to actually do a, a quick synopsis. What, what's it going to look like if people start to go online and they start looking at what Hebrew roots are? Uh, they'll, they'll find that there's some very interesting things out there. We want to look at some of those tonight. And then we want to kind of digress through them and go through them and look at them closely. It's what's being said because some say some really good things and then there's some things in it that you just kind of scratch your head and go, huh? <laughs> you know, obviously they don't know us as well as they think they do. But then I'm also going to bring in a premise that I think is important for each of us to realize. And it goes right back to the very first lesson that I taught is starting with the Shema connection is that each and every one of us have an individual testimony. And so each and every one of us are going to come away with a different definition of what Hebrew roots are and what they mean to us. So we're going to give you a very generic, a, a very preliminary view of what that is, and then we're going to build on that. And, and hopefully as we go through the process, you'll be enriched, you'll be encouraged, uh, and that Yahweh will help you a great deal. There's two passages of Scripture that I really want us to look at to start with uh, as we start this lesson tonight. The first one is going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 1 and 2. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Or if you want to, you can just look up on the screen with me here. Um, I had way too much fun playing on trying to get those letters to follow the page. It was a, a lot of fun, but... Huh. Here's what it says. It says, be imitators of me. Wow. Be imitators of me as I am also of Messiah. But I, I praise you, brothers, that in all things you have remembered me, and even as I delivered them to you, you, have, you, have hold, uh, you hold fast to the doctrines. I find this interesting. Here, here's, here's Rabbi Shaul. This is Paul speaking. He's speaking to the Corinthians, and if you know anything about the Corinth and what goes on in that major metropolis and, and all the sin that was going on, if you, if you read through Corinthians and you see all the mess that the church was in at that moment in time in history, and Paul is saying, okay, here's what you do. You remember when I was with you? Remember how I behaved? Do you remember that? This means Yes. All right, you guys pretend you're Corinthian church. Okay, yes, you remember? Yeah. Well, while I was with you, I, I told you and I showed you and I set the example, yes? All right, so you should follow that, yes. Why? Because I'm imitating Christ. So here's a verse right here I love. As we're, we're further in the future, as we look at, at, at Hebrew roots, we're going we're gonna to look at Yeshua versus Paul's teaching. But look what Paul is saying here. Is he teaching a new doctrine? No. Who is he imitating? And what doctrines is, is he teaching? He's teaching the Messiahs. Who's his Messiah? Yeshua. So he's telling us, hey, model me, because all of us sometimes need someone physically, tangibly, that we can look to and say, I get it now. Because if you don't see it and you're a visual learner, you don't get it. My wife is this way. She's a visual learner. I have to draw it out on paper. A plus B equals C. Right? No, that, that's not math. That's alphabet. So it's A, then B, then C. Math would be 1 plus 1 is... Wow, you guys are really with it tonight. <laughs> You're tired already. Uh, and, and so she needs to see that. Just me saying it's not going to help. So what I have to do is go, one plus one equals two, okay? She, oh, I got that. And then she says, boy, that's fun. Can I try that? So she'll go, one plus one equals two. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> got to drop this hand. And so we have fun with it. So we need tangible things. So Paul's saying here, you can imitate me. Why? Because my passion and my desire and my hope is nothing else than to follow my Messiah. And I like what he uses here. In, in some translations, it uses the word traditions, which is really nice too. And doctrines is used here. What doctrines is he talking about? All right, well, let's think about who he's imitating. 
He's imitating Yeshua. And Yeshua's doctrines are coming from where? The Torah. It's coming from the Tanakh, all of Scripture. In fact, I like how Yeshua teaches it because when he talks about following Scripture, he starts off with the law first, the Torah. Usually when somebody says something first or it's number one, it's the most important on the list, is it not? So he starts out and says the Torah which for us is the foundational scriptures because almost everything can go back and relate to the Torah. Even the prophet Isaiah says, you want to know the ending? Go back to the beginning. Well, where's the beginning? Matthew? <laughs> Genesis. So you have to go back to the Torah. And then Yeshua taught the second thing was the prophets because then the prophets are going to be telling about me. So not only do you have the Torah telling us about Yeshua and who he is as Messiah, but you also now have the prophets that are telling about who Yeshua is so you can identify him and know that you've got the right one. And then he talks about the writings, the Psalms, the Proverbs, those things that help us in our life, that just have little tidbits that encourages us and lifts us up and also points very much to the Messiah. Look at Psalm 119, how much it talks about the Torah and how beautiful the word is, that it is a light unto our path, and that it, it illuminates the way that we're supposed to go. Did, did, did you get that? It shows us how to live. The light that lights the way gives us the instructions so we can follow it. So it's really kind of cool. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 and 2. Be imitators of Messiah. And then the second passage that we want to use here is Philippians 2 and verse 5. It says, For let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yeshua. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Yeshua Messiah. So as Paul is talking to the Corinthians, he is now talking to the Philippians saying the exact same message. But a lot of times we will quote this and we'll go, well, what, what, what is it we're supposed to uh, be shown? Well, let, let, me, uh, let me share with you from the, the Hallelujah Scriptures, uh, Philippians 2, starting in verse 1. It says, if then there is any encouragement in Messiah. So Messiah is going to be encouraging to us. If any comfort of love, the comfort of love that Messiah is showing us, if any fellowship of the Ruach of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, Paul says to the Philippians, having the same love, one in being and of purpose, doing not through selfishness or self-conceit, but in humility considering others better than yourself. Each one should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. For, let this mind. He defined it. We just looked at it. What does Messiah look like? That's the mind you're supposed to be putting on. And so as we look at what it means in, in Hebrew roots, these are the verses that I'm going to build on because really this is the premise of everything in our lives. Folks, we at Seed of Abraham have a, a creed that we go by. I, I hate to call it a creed because it's not really a creed. But we do have basic instructions. And, and we do have a little booklet with questions and answers in it that's going to give you some understanding about some of the basic questions. And it answers it basically and quickly so you'll be able to understand what we think and believe on the surface very quickly. But understand that it goes much deeper than just these few pages can do and, and some, what, 15, 18 questions that we answer in here. And so as we look at this, our basis always has to come back to God's Word, period. There's nothing else that I can stand on because there's no truth other than the truth that we find in His Word, none whatsoever. And now comes the hard part. Because as we start to look at what's out there and, and looking at defining Hebrew roots, I, I've had a very interesting week. I normally don't have much communication with my devices. 
In other words, when I'm watching TV, if, if I'm moved emotionally, I, I don't really converse with the TV much. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm at my computer, I don't really talk to it very much. But this week, <laughs> the people that were in this box were driving me absolutely crazy because the foolishness of what was coming out of their mouths. I spent over 28 different messages about what heretics we are because we want to follow the Scripture. Uh, we've been called a cult. Now, a cult isn't really a bad thing, but in our perception, because it's so close to a cult, which is not good, being a cult is just a gathering of people who have come together for a certain purpose. And so we have come together as a purpose of believers, but these guys are taking it and making it look like we're abandoning in Yeshua, that we're abandoning the Scriptures, that we're trying to go back underneath the law of the oral law of following all the things and traditions of Judaism. And, and yet, I understand where they're coming from because underneath this umbrella of Hebrew roots, it goes from one spectrum to the other. You've got way over here on, on your left side, you have got these people that are so indoctrinated in Judaism that when they start their Sabbath evening out on Friday evening before the sunset, they light their candles, the woman has the thing overhead, she's breathing in the smoke, she does the prayer, does everything that is rabbinical and Judaistic and follows Judaism to the letter. They cannot turn a light switch on or off because it, it's creating fire. And so they have all these rules and regulations, and so they're very orthodox in their thinking. And so they've adopted and taken on a lot of Judaism. In fact, to some point, as you will find in your research, some of these people have gotten so caught up in going back to the traditions within Judaism that they've even questioned, and some have left their faith in Yeshua Messiah. That's the far left. We're not there. Then you've got the far right. The far right says Hebrew roots. We are. Yay. We can do whatever we want. It doesn't matter. And so they're very liberal. They're, they're very uh, um, lackadaisical in their stances. They, they don't, they're really just on thin ice, really, because they, they, they say they want to be messianic. They say they want to be Hebrew roots. They want to go back to understanding what the lifestyle was that Yahweh intended for us to begin with, which is following his instructions. And yet they say, well, most of that doesn't really apply anymore. So they pick and choose just what makes them feel good. That is the other side. That's going to be the right side underneath this umbrella of called Hebrew roots. Now, it doesn't matter what label you put above that thing. You can put Christianity, because in Christianity you can have the Bible thumper, who's a King James only, that gets up there and rants and raves and slams his pulpit and hollers and screams and says, you know, it's King James only, and when you look at the passage of Scripture where it says that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and he's thumping his Bible and screaming and spits coming out his mouth and smoke out his ears, I mean, he's passionate about what he believes. But is he correct? No, if, if he took a little bit of time and did some study, the letter J wasn't introduced in the world until the beginning of the 1600s. It was about 1638 that it started being put into Bibles. I have an original King James 1611 uh, page from the Bible, and there is no J on it. Yeshua's name is Jesus. Now, the, the I in uh, Esus, which was later changed the sound of I, was changed to an E in the Greek, so it's Esus. Prior to that, it was Yasus, and so they translated it over, but it doesn't carry the same meaning as his Hebrew name, Yahshua, which Yah is short for Yahweh, the very breath of God, Yahweh. And so his name is Yahweh, Elohim saves. And, and yet, if you just studied that a little bit, all of a sudden, the important thing is not how you say it when you're coming to this verse. This verse, what's important about it, it is the person, Yeshua. 
that you will bow to, that he is divinity, he is God. And so to, to get on a rant and rave about it, those of us that have studied and have gone on and, and, and gotten later degrees in our lives from masters and, and forward, when we see someone like this who starts ranting and raving and understand they haven't even scholastically looked at this properly, where'd the chair go? There it is. Uh, weebles wobble, but they don't fall over. Uh, we get a little frustrated because there's, you shouldn't just get up and mouth off without doing a little bit of research. It's so important. But underneath that same umbrella where you have this conservative, ecumenical, Baptist, King James only, and he's died in the wool, you know, he's raised that way, and then you go over here, and then you've got the Episcopalian church that falls underneath Christianity who just absolutely adores the fact that the court, the Supreme Court of the United States, overrid God's view of marriage. As if we can do that. Well, evidently it's okay because the Catholic Church decided that they could change worship, or not worship, excuse me, change Sabbath, the day of rest, from Saturday to Sunday and make it worship instead of rest. So you don't need a rest day anymore. You just need to come and worship on Sunday. We'll do away with that Sabbath thing. It's just not needed. So you can do whatever you want. Now, just because they did that, does that make it right? No, there's nowhere in Scripture where anything has changed. Concerning the Sabbath, it is still the seventh day. Friday sunset, Saturday sunset, it is a day of rest, and it is His appointed time, not ours. He governed it. He set it in place. It is His. We are to observe it. End of story. It should be that simple. And yet, because of our own pride, our own desire to do what we want to do, so that we can have seven days to do whatever it is that we want to do, we choose to ignore His Word completely. And unfortunately, the church is bought into that as well. So as we look at both spectrums, what we see in the whole thing is we see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, you know, when we read Scripture, we have to understand this is not one of those situations where you're hot or cold, I'll spew you out, so if you're not way over here, ultra-conservative and, and Bible-thumping, then you're not really in, or if you're way over here, very liberal. That's not, that's not the premise of the good, bad, and evil. It's simply this, what is truth, and that's it. There is no scale other than right and wrong. This is what God said, period. Whether you like it or not, James, I'm sorry. God's truth is God's truth. And whether I like it or not is irrelevant. Who am I to question the creator of the universe? He knows how many hairs I have on my head. Do you? No, how many on your head, not mine. <laughs> I counted yours the other day. Uh, no. We don't. So we have to remember who we are and our place, and sometimes that's tough. But let's, let's look at what the world thinks when they, when they think about Hebrew roots, and people start to look. So they like to go to the Wikipedia, which is the free online encyclopedia that you can look stuff up. Here's what it says. Hebrew roots is a contemporary Christian religious movement that advocates the return and adherence to the first century walk of faith and obedience to the Torah by Jesus, known as Yeshua HaMashiach, the Hebrew name for Jesus the Messiah. I like that. That's who I am, kind of in a nutshell. They got that right, but they didn't stop. By better seeking or seeking a better understanding of the culture, history, and now here's where we start getting stuff religio-political backdrop of the era which led to the core differences with both the Jewish and later the Christian communities. And there's pretty much, I can follow most all of that, but some of it is out of the realms of which I don't want to go. And, and of course, that has to do with the political backdrop about it. What is interesting here, though, is they do have it nailed when they say this, that it is the difference between both the Jewish at that time and continue today, but then it was later on. It wasn't immediate. It was later on that the Christian communities that they differed with. Why? Because the church as we know it today evolved around 350 A.D. The ecclesia, the assembly, the way that followed Yeshua HaMashiach 
continued to meet in the synagogues with their Jewish brothers and learn the teachings of Moshe, it tells us in Acts chapter 15 so that both Jew and Gentile were to learn the teachings of Moshe. Now, what is the teaching of Moshe? Now, unfortunately, a lot of research I did, they are equating the Mosaic Covenant with the entire Old Testament, which you can't do. There is a lot of differences between the law, between the prophets and the writings. And even within the law, when you start to understand Paul's teaching, Paul teaches there are at least 16 different ways to divide the Torah. Peter talks about three ways. So there's ways of looking at the Torah that we have to make sure that we understand explicitly what's being said and keep it in context. And so to just blatantly use one big blanket to make it all fit doesn't necessarily work. Now, the religio-political had to do with what was going on during the, the very first century when Yeshua was here. See, the Jewish people at this particular point in time in history were really frustrated with where they were in the world. They wanted their Messiah to come. They were looking for a Messiah. And they read the Tanakh. They read the Old Testament so that they would know who the Messiah was and what they were looking for. And unfortunately, they were looking for a man that was going to come and sit on the throne of David, of David, where he would rule and reign and set up a political kingdom and put these Romans in their place because they did not like being underneath the rulership of the Roman government. And so that's the big religious political thing that was going on during Yeshua's time. So many people that saw Yeshua were thinking, hey, yeah, if he's the Messiah, then that's what he's going to do. He's going to drive Herod out. He's going to be on the throne. He's going to get the Romans in place because if, if he is the Messiah and he's going to do what he said he's going to do, the rest of the world is going to be bowing to him. And that's what they were looking for. Now, they got it right, but they missed some time. The timing's off. They didn't realize that Isaiah 53 had to be fulfilled first. That the Messiah had to come as Ben Yosef. He had to come like Joseph as a suffering servant first. That the coming of the Messiah did so much more than just the political regime that they wanted started up. There, there was the spiritual part of it as well. Because what happened in the garden? See, again, we can go back to the beginning. What happened in the garden to Adam and Eve? Was it just a spiritual thing that affected them? Or was it spiritual and physical? It was both, was it not? So Messiah, His coming, there's so many things in Scripture that, that His coming was dealing with. He was dealing with the, the sacrifices in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 15. Chapter 15, a death penalty had to be paid. It had to be God, to, had to be the one who died. He did that. He came to be the one to, to be able to buy back or to, to bring back the bride, the northern uh, uh, part of Israel that had been divorced from Him. And so the only way that could happen, when we, when we say our covenant, when Tina and I gave our covenants, one of the lines that we said in our covenant was, till death do us part. She's threatened to kill me many times. <laughs> Why? Because it's a blood covenant that we, we commit to a, until death do us part. Once we, one of us dies, then that covenant of marriage is no longer valid. Why? Because one of us is dead. You don't have a live thing and dead thing. I mean, I, can you see Tina walking around dragging me around dead? I mean, she does that when she takes me to the store now, but that's a whole different story. Uh, it, no, it just doesn't make sense, does it? So Yeshua had to die to pay the penalty, but like the song we sang this evening, he didn't stay dead. He rose and he is alive so that now he could bring back that's what's so beautiful about this romantic story of Messiah coming and dying for his bride. So he could win her back and war back and she comes back to him. When you read scripture and see how the whole house of Israel comes back together, that's the new covenant. When the new covenant comes together, when you have the house of Israel and the house of Judah coming together, and the Torah that everybody says done away with is going to be on their hearts. And I beg to differ with people who say, well, the Torah is written on our hearts now. 
I only have one question to ask. Have you ever sinned? And if you say yes, you're correct. Is it because you didn't know right from wrong? No. But does that mean the Torah is written on your heart? Not necessarily, because you can't quote me the Torah, can you? There's so many instructions that he has for us that we fall short of that. And so there is a very difficult and dividing line there for us to understand that part of that prophecy has not been fulfilled. It is still in a process. And a few weeks back, we looked at that as we looked at the Abrahamic covenant. It took 2,000 years to come into completion. And from Yeshua until today has been roughly 2,000 years. So maybe there's a pattern there that we could follow. So all this religious stuff is going on. All this political stuff is going on. And the Jewish people wanted, they, they, they were getting it from all sides. And here's some of the ways that they were getting it. First of all, they were getting it from the non-believing pagans who hated anything Jewish. Sound familiar today? I, mean, I, I was looking at a, a map of the region of the Mideast there, and you've got little teeny Israel there, which is just a small land mass. And all around it, it's showing all the Muslim countries around it. And it was in red. And you've got this beautiful red map with one little teeny dot, and that's Israel, who is a democratic, non-Muslim country, and yet an Arab that has uh, religious beliefs of Muslim gets to live there freely and worship the way they want to. Isn't that amazing? The Jews are so bad. And yet they allow them to come in. They have to keep a close eye on them because they do bad things to the Israelites, but the pagans all around them, even today, even in their mists, have hatred for them, and they don't even know why. They're raised that way, and, and there's just that hatred. And we know what it is. It's the enemy who, from the beginning, back going all the way again to Genesis, his seed is against the seed of Yeshua. And so he's plotting and planning to do whatever he can to this people that God has chosen as his own. Then there's a second group of people. And this is from the non-believing Jews who feared their power among the people. So you have these people that, that were living in Israel at the time, and the Roman government was there. And so because of fear of the Romans, they weren't really religious. They didn't, you know, weren't part of the, uh, the Orthodox system. Uh, but they were Jewish, and they lived in the community. And so they were just like, you know, leave well enough alone. Just don't even, you know, we don't need to go up in arms against them. We don't need to fight against the political regime. We're doing okay. Everything is fine. Let's leave it alone. And then you got the third that is within their own congregations by the new Gentile believers who are entering their faith already affected by the rampant anti-Semitism. So all that is coming in and they were facing it from every single direction. And so here is the, the Jewish people of that day that were trying to follow Yahweh, finding themselves getting bombarded from every single angle. How do I live out my faith? How do I walk in my faith as the way I'm supposed to? And so they were struggling with this. And this is all the things in the upheaval that was going on. Because during this time, you've got to remember that the, the religious systems, plural, within Judaism, which Judaism wasn't religion at that point, but in the temple area, the, you had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, and you had several other political religious groups in there that were all vying for power so that they could be the elite. And so they, they came up with all these extra rules and regulations. I, one of them is, you know, lighting the candles before Shabbat, washing your hands ceremoniously three times this way, three times this way, wiping them and doing a certain ritual before you eat. And then they said, well, that is scripture. And they tried to make it mandatory that we all do that because that's what scripture tells us. But it wasn't scripture that Yahweh gave. It was their scripture, their adaptation. It was the oral law. And so they added all these things on. So when Yeshua comes and he says, hey, time out. I don't recognize any of that. I only recognize my father's word. The only thing that I live by is the Torah that's written within these pages. This is the only thing that I've come to do, the will of my Father. The will of my Father is right here in these pages, not the Talmud, not the Mishnah, not all the commentaries that you might have out there. It's right here. This is what our Messiah followed. 
And so in Hebrew roots, those of us that are desiring to come back to the word embrace the idea of Hebrew roots for several different reasons, and we'll look at that at another lesson. But most of all, this is a Jewish book for a Jewish people. Now, I, I, and even that's wrong terminology. This is a Hebrew book. <laughs> Let me correct myself, because I was wrong. It's not Jewish. Jewish has to do with the tribe of Judah. Hebrew means called out ones. Hebrew, the Hebrew word of Scripture, written by Hebrew men, so that we are the called out ones. And we are grafted into this people who have been called out. So we are part of the spiritual Israel. And we, we talk about that also in this booklet here. When we become believers and followers of Messiah to be his disciple, we're not Jews. We, we don't, I don't instantaneously, when I, when I started following Messiah, my blood changed from, from French Lambert to Jewish blood in my veins. It, it didn't happen. I'm still red like yours. My ethnicity goes all the way back to King Henry IV in France. And... Uh, uh, that's my heritage. And what can I say? I'm, I'm French. Good blood. Yeah? We? Oui. Yeah. So uh, that didn't change. But what did change is my, my, uh, uh, my, my core beliefs, but, but my, my, my desire to follow Yahweh became so intense on just following Him that I gave up everything. I gave up my, my heritage that was mine, and I took on his heritage. I'm part of his house. I'm under his covering. I came into his tent. And so now, being in his house, under his authority, do I follow my own rules anymore? I shouldn't. I should be following his. So that's the premise of where we come from when we, we talk about being in Messiah or following Yeshua HaMashiach, that He is our Master, our Savior, and we are His disciples, someone who's coming alongside to learn from Him. Well, then we, we look at the history that's behind it um, as far as what's been happening with Hebrews in the 20th century. Well, back in 1916, to a very limited degree, uh, there was a group of people that have kind of... Uh, come together and, and have, have been called the Messianic Judaism. And so uh, they started their own organization, and these people came together, and so they started uh, a Messianic Judaism. So what this is, again, that one that's on the far left that, that believes in Yeshua, being the Messiah, but they want to practice Judaism because they feel like the two are synonymously one. And, and then in 1937, you see the sacred name movement that came up and started. And, and probably some of you have heard that. If you go on the internet, you can find several speakers uh, that are talking about this. And they're one of these that, boy, uh, depending on who you're listening to, if you just very minutely come off the wrong way with the sacred name, man, you're, you're exed. You're, you're just, you're a pagan, you're a heathen, and you're out. And they don't exhibit the, the same things that we just learned in, in Philippians chapter 2 where we're supposed to have the mind of Yeshua. So we need to teach them why the name of Yeshua is important, why the name of Yahweh is important, because in them is life. And the power is in the name, not in abbreviations or anything else. And then in the 1930s, you have the Worldwide Church of, of God, uh, where Armstrong had developed a... a a church that went back to the, the Hebrew roots, if you will, and they incorporated the Old Testament feast, and they looked at the Sabbath. And then after he died, uh, it, it's amazing that the elders of the church decided that they wanted to be more uh, in the Christian realm, and so they changed a lot of things, and there was a lot of breakoffs and separations. In fact, uh, Brad Scott comes out from the world Worldwide Church of God. And, and uh, if you've ever listened to Brad Scott and his teaching, he's, he's one of these that, man, he's got some great teaching as far as getting us to go back to the purest form of the Hebrew words and understanding what they mean because in the purest words, it's like going to, to a river and, and following that river all the way back up the mountain and, and finding the fresh springs where it comes out so that when the rain fills these springs and they come out and the earth has filtered out all the yuck that's, that 
could be in the water, and you have the purest form of water. It has all the nutrients and minerals and everything that you want in it that is refreshing and good for your body. That's where it's the purest, and so that's where you want to get it. But unfortunately, most of us are getting our tap water uh, from the very base of the river that is about to go in the ocean that has come down the mountain. And so you have all the dead carcasses of the animals and the decay and rotting bodies and the pus and everything else that's now in the water and it's amalgamating as it's going through the water. And then it goes by these different plants that are emptying all the different garbage into the, into the water and that's mixing in the water. And then you've got all of these sewer plants in our different cities that as long as they have 85% of the water purified, then they can put it back into the water because they feel like the solution to pollution is dilution. So you just dilute it down enough and so you know it, it's not going to matter, right? So we're going to have 15% of poop water go right back into the water system and so it goes out and as it's heading out to the sea, we decide that we're going to put a pipe in there, we're going to pump it out and we're going to put it into your faucet and you get to drink it. Yummy. Which would you rather have, that faucet water, or would you like to climb up the top of the mountain and get the fresh, clean, pure? That's why it's important for us to go back and understand the Hebrew mindset and understanding of his word, because it takes us to the purest form and get the understanding that Yahweh really intended for us to have in the first place. And then we see later on in the last 20, 25 years, Hebrew roots, as we look at it today, has really been taking off, and it's amazing. It really is amazing, folks. There's some things in here that we're going to talk about real briefly as I skim over them. Uh, but if we, if we were to stop and realize, I have the privilege of, of answering the Torah class phone. So when people go to the website and they listen to Tom's teaching or they're glancing through the site and they listen to uh, Baruch and his teaching or they listen to Moran and his teaching and they, and they glance through it and they want to call somebody at Torah class, guess who they talk to? And so I go, hello, how are you? No, I go, <laughs> thank you for calling Seed of Abraham Fellowship. This is Gary. How may I help you? And, and people all over the world call me. I've talked to people in Finland. I've talked to people in New Zealand. I've talked to people in Australia, in Canada. I, I mean, I've been, I've been blessed to talk to a lot of different people. And inevitably, once or twice a week, I have someone. To, this week, I had two people for the first time call me say, we have just started listening to Tom's teaching, and we are so excited. I had a pastor about a month ago call us up and say, I gave up the ministry 30 years of preaching because I knew I wasn't teaching truth, and there was just something missing. There was too many gaps in my religion of, and then he said the background that he was from, and he said, I just, I was so frustrated, and I, I told the Lord, I can't keep telling lies because the dots weren't connected, and it was too empty. He gave up his ministry after 30 years and went back into the secular world and worked in a regular job, and the Lord led him to Tom's teaching, and in one week, he and his wife have devoured the whole book of Genesis, part of Exodus. Now, if you know, uh, Tom's lessons are about 40, 45 minutes, sometimes 50 minutes. Genesis alone has over 38 lessons in it. They're devouring because they, they want to get back to what Scripture says. They want to follow what Messiah is teaching. Now, that doesn't mean that we have it all right. We're just blessed that we are, have a vehicle in which we can present and have something there for people. And this has helped this man out tremendously. He's passed it on to his son or son-in-law. I can't remember which one it is now, who is also in the ministry and is now teaching his church these truths. So for whatever reason, Yahweh is starting to open the floodgates and calling us back to Torah, back to the beginning. What he is doing, he is making ready his bride. Because he said he's coming back for his bride, right? And you remember he gives the parable of the ten virgins, the ten bridesmaids, uh, the ten, yeah. It's been so long since I got married, I forget how it works. Anyway, they, there's ten brides, and, and five of them, didn't, didn't make it. Why? They, they didn't have their, the, the stuff that they needed. They started out okay, but they didn't end well. And, and anybody knows that in a race, just because you can get to the start line and, and the gun fires off and you take off, if you stop and look around, are you going to win? Not a chance. If you stop and quit, do you ever cross the finish line? You haven't really run a race. And so these five virgins, they weren't ready. So when the bridegroom came, 
And they weren't ready because they were still out doing what they wanted to do instead of being ready, adorned, and ready to be taken up by the groom. They were left. And when they came back later and said, oh, we're ready now, he said what? Too late. Now, people say, well, that's awful harsh. I don't think the Lord's going to be that way. Well, let's go back again to the Tanakh and find out through the examples of our beloved people Israel. And the men of Israel were commanded by God to go in and take the land. And they go out and they spy the land. They come back and they go... They're big. We're grasshoppers. We're little. They will squash us. We ain't doing it. So 10 of the 12 spies throw in the towel. They quit. They stop running the race. They say, we can't do it. So Yahweh says, okay, because of your lack of faith and trust in me, 40 years in the wilderness. Well, now, wait a minute, God. This I don't like this deal. I think I'm going to change it. So I guess we're ready now. So they get together. They get a group of them. They go over the mountain. They decide to fight. Moses says, don't do it. The hand of God is no longer on you. He has made a decision. You have made your decision. There's no changing it. If you go over there, you will die. No, no, no. We were. This is what he said the first time. This is what we're going to go with, and we're going to go over. So they go over, and guess what? They didn't come back. And the ones that did came back dragging and limping because they were casualties of war. In a war that was their own, it wasn't the Messiah's. The Messiah said, I will go before you and you won't have an enemy because I'm going to take care of them. And when it was time and Yeshua went in and they took the city of Jericho, what did the people do? Classic strategy of warfare. They marched around the city. Not one day, not two day. On the third day, people up on the, the walls were looking down and going, look at these crazy Israelites. What are they doing? If they keep this up, they're going to wear a groove around there and we're going to have our own new moat all around here. <laughs> yeah, that's what we can do. Look at those guys. Day five. Oh, man, let's... This is ridiculous. Day seven. Did they pick up swords? Did they run the wall? No, Yeshua said, blow the trumpet. They blew the trumpet, the walls come down. Then he said, go ahead, go in. He did it because it was his task, his time, his provision. And when we follow his ways, it will be right. When we do it our way, it's always going to be wrong. Absolutely. So, a little stuff digressing there on the, on the side route. So let's look at a website called Apologetics. Uh, at the, the back page on your sheet, I, I left that website there. You can go look at it. Listen to what it says. It says, what is Hebrew roots? Kind of at a glance. It's a diverse, and I will agree with that. It is a diverse. Tonight, I'm not even going to really give you a definition to say, write this down. This is what it is. It's so diverse. But you have a diverse global religious movement with many variations and graduations of teachings and practices but with one common emphasis, to restore what is considered to be, and I, I, again, I don't like the terminology here, they say Jewishness, when it should be Hebrewness of Christianity, because our roots are in the set-aside ones, or the called-out ones, the Hebrews. All right, The Jews are from the tribe of Yehuda, Judah, and so we are not necessarily all from the tribe of Judah. That doesn't mean that the Jews don't have good stuff for us, because they do. And then uh, alternate names, of course, there's the Hebraic roots, there's the Jewish roots, there's the HRM, which is a Hebrew movement, kind of the abbreviation for it. There's the Messianic uh, Hebrew roots. And, and, you know, really, when you stop and think about it, who do we serve? Are we not serving Yeshua HaMashiach, right? Yeshua, the anointed one. Yeshua Christos in Greek, which would be anointed one. Christ, our Messiah. So, yeah, we're all messianic. Whether you're uh, 
from a Baptist church, if you're following Messiah, then you're still Messianic. And see, they miss that. It's one of those that goes whoop, right over their heads. But if you are a follower of Messiah, then you are Messianic. If you're not following Messiah, you're just messy. But sometimes even within the, the congregation itself is pretty messy too. Uh, continuing in the apologetics, it says that the Messianic community, the majority of the Hebrew roots adhere are Gentiles, which is true. About 80% to 85% of those that come into Hebrew roots are Gentiles. And then about 15% are Jewish. They have Hebraic blood in them from whichever tribe and yet they see Messiah and they want to follow him. Many, certainly not all of them, prefer to be known as Messianic Christians. And I, for one, because of the terminology that's applied to this, do not like to be called Messianic Christians because it labels me as something I'm not, which is a left-hand wing person. But the same thing is true with calling me a Christian. I was, I was born and raised a Christian, I grew up in a church that I claimed Christianity, and so I was a Christian for many, many years. Now, am I a Christian today? If you mean by Christian a follower of Christ, following the Messiah, yes. But if you mean the Christianity that's out there in America today, uh, I would have to say no. I, I was watching Ray Comfort interview some people on the boardwalk as he was witnessing to them. And you, you look at these people and the way that they were dressed, and they looked just like the rest of the world. They were doing the cursing and the drinking in public and, and making a public display of themselves and talked uh, loosely about the, the, the way that they lived. And then Ray Comfort asked them, do you think that you are a Christian? And they said, yes. So why would I want to be associated with a person that is all anti everything that is scriptural? I wouldn't want to be. So I have difficulty when someone says to, you, to me, are you a Christian? I have to take a step back and say, what do you mean? What do you mean by Christian? If you mean follower of Yeshua, follower of Christ, absolutely, 100%. There's, there's not a bone in my body that doesn't ache to be with him. You know? and, and that's the way it should be. So um, part of going through this whole process is finding our identity, who we are, because Every single one of us is going to come out of here with just a little bit different take on the information that you get. And every single one of us is going to come out with a little different take on how we view uh, Hebrew roots. And, and, and that's good because God created us all unique and different. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be any fun if we were all the same. Um, I don't know if I could speak to a whole room of people that look just like me. I wouldn't be speaking to them. <laughs> As far as an organizational structure as a whole, and, and what they mean by this when in, in this particular website is that they don't have a denominational head where you have a hierarchy, where you have district superintendents, and you have all these general superintendents and all those other people that are uh, orchestrating the whole of the churches to make sure that they all stay in unanimity, that they all follow the exact same doctrines and rules and regulations set forth by their policies and stuff like that. That most of these organizations, and they talk about roughly 10 or 15 people that have become very prominent as far as Hebrew roots, uh, I mentioned Brad Scott a few moments ago. Uh, I can mention uh, Eddie Chumney. I can talk about Rico Cortez. I can talk about, um, well, there, there's several out there. And these are all good men. You can learn something from each one of them. But you also realize that there's some things that they teach that you may not agree with either. But the thing is, is they're out there and they're proclaiming it. And that they're sharing and that they're digging into the word and they're bringing you knowledge. I mean, Matthew, Matthew Nolan is another one that's out there that's, that's digging into God's word. Uh, a new gentleman that I've been listening to the last couple of weeks and gleaning a great deal is Alan Horvath. Um, he's got some great teaching too. Uh, actually helping me to understand paleo and oto uh, Hebrew and Aramaic so I can go even further back, back to this spring water to understand it. And so there's these, these men that are out there uh, that are teaching truth and it's important for us to, to understand that. Now, with that being said, sometimes there's a red flag that goes up and they go, well, if there's no organization, then everybody's out there doing their own thing. Well, not necessarily because 
several of these people that I just talked about, we have one here in Florida. I forgot to mention him because I really do like him. He's weird, but I really like him. Maybe that's why I like him. Paul Nissan, uh, and, and he is uh, just a great guy. And, and he's, his whole thing is really about going back to being healthy and following the Torah and having a moral lifestyle. And so these guys are not out there on their own as so many of the sites would make you un think that they are. These guys are talking back and forth and are bouncing things off of one another and, and are, are actually have come together, not to form a group, but they've come together in brotherhood as iron sharpens iron. I know that um, Rico Cortez has at least six or seven different people, men and women, that will come on and do Bible and Midrash uh, and talk about different topics on the internet, and you can go join in and listen. And they'll have four, five, six hundred people listening to these different things that have been... So there is accountability there, which is a good thing. Now, Seed of Abraham Fellowship, us here, we are not an entity in and of ourselves. We are Seed of Abraham Ministries, which composes of five different ministries. We have one head leader that God has chosen to start this whole thing. It's Tom Bradford. Tom is the senior guy over everything, not because he's the oldest guy, uh, but God has chosen him to be the one to start it, and through him he started this work. But Tom is not uh, without a board of accountability. There are, how many of you guys? Five of you? There's five guys on the board that things go to, and they don't always agree. They'll go around the room, and there'll be five different opinions, and five different answers, and five different things that will come up, and they will talk about it, and sometimes they walk out of the room and not always agree at the end, but they always walk out in prayer and ask to be in unison with the Father, to follow what the Father wants. And I pray that we continue to do that, because that's important. If we don't, we're, we're in trouble. And, uh, so we just need to pray for our leaders that God will give them wisdom to know what and how and where and why and follow in his footsteps. Another website was uh, gutquestions.org and, and the answer as far as the Hebrew root, they said the premise of the Hebrew root movement is the belief that the church has veered far from the true teachings and the Hebrew concepts of the Bible. And that is what we do believe. We do believe that they have veered quite a ways, in fact. The movement maintains that Christianity has been indoctrinated with the culture and beliefs of Greek and Roman philosophy and that ultimately biblical Christianity taught in the churches today has been corrupted with a pagan imitation of the New Testament Gospels. Ah, I agree. Uh, and it doesn't take much. Do you know how to do it? Somebody have a pen out there? Anybody have a pen? Throw it up to me real quick. Someone close. Just don't poke me in the eye. Well, you almost hit him. All right, there we go. All right. So this is how you can know whether or not it's good or bad, right? You take this pen and you compare it with another pen. Do they look alike? So something's wrong. One of them's right and one is wrong. You say, wait a minute, they're two different pens. They're da -da -da -da. No, no, go with me. All right. Pretend. You have a pen. This is a pen. This is the pen that we want to have. See, this pen is the pen that Yahweh wants us to use. This is the only pen he described in his scriptures. This is the only one he gave. He told us it's, to suppose, it's supposed to be 6.1 inches long. It's to have gold in it. It's supposed to have wood representing the stake that Yeshua died on. It's to have a red finish to it that represents the blood of Yeshua that was shed for us. And you are supposed to use this pen so that you can let the rest of the world know of the redeeming blood of Yeshua Hamashimit. And so this is the pen you're supposed to be using. And we go, it doesn't matter. I've got a pen. Does it matter? Will this pen tell the same testimony this tells? No. Now, this is a great pen if you want to talk about two different things. First of all, this is called thinking quick on your feet. First of all, you look at the colors blue and white representing of what? Israel. So you can talk about Israel, and you can go in all different areas. But also it speaks of glory or heaven or things of Yahweh. So this could be a whole different testimony. And it has some good things to say about it but it's not what the Father instructed us. 
It might look good, it might act good, it might feel good to you, but it's not what the Father said. So if your church or your denomination or your get-together does not follow this book, not church doctrine, not church polity, those are books that will help you govern your church, your organization, your fellowship, you have to have those. Those are important. You've got to know who's clean in the toilets. You've got to know how to organizationally structure things to make sure that it operates right. That's the facility. That's the business part. You've got to have those. But those are not ordained of God. This is. If your fellowship doesn't line up with this, then you're a different color pen. And it's just that simple. And so if, if you have in your religiosity, in your system, something that doesn't line up with this, or you maintain this principle that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that's a quote in Revelation that not only Yeshua is given to, to Yochanan or John at that moment, but he is actually referring what the, the Father has given to him to give to John. So pretty important. And so Yeshua is telling John, write this down and don't seal the book. Everybody needs to know this, that Yahweh says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And oh, by the way, it's also quoted in the Tanakh. So the, the people already knew that. So nothing of Yahweh changes. He stays the same. But we've changed the day of rest. We've decided that we don't know, don't need any more the appointed times that he gave us in Leviticus 23. We call them feasts, some of us, and, and in our different programs, but you have, you have the Passover, you have unleavened, you have first fruits, death, burial, and resurrection. Well, we don't need those. We'll substitute it, and we'll make it Eshtar celebration. I mean, an Easter celebration. Oh, they are the same. Huh, sorry. So uh, we'll just substitute it for that. That's okay, right? And, and then, while well, Shavuot, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the giving of the Word, breath of God that comes upon us to guide us, where he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, wait a minute, why did he say that? Well, that's a whole other teaching that we'll get to someday. But the whole idea of us putting a burden on our back and being yoked with the Spirit of God is so that we can work for our Messiah. Ooh, whole different teaching, pretty cool. And then you have the Feast of Trumpets, and then you've got Yom Kippur, and then you've got Sukkot, but we don't need those anymore because that's Old Testament, but yet you have violated the very principle that you're teaching that you say that God is the same yesterday, day, forever. And if Elohim is the same, then you should be able to keep the same things, but we don't. So are we following scriptures? And that's why when you see the statement that says that we don't agree with the philosophy, the customs, and culture that is in a lot of churches because it's not God's Word. It's something else. It's man-made. It's to make them feel good. The kids love running around getting little eggs. They like the candy. They like all the presents that they get to bow to as they bow to that tree and pull out the gifts. You know, they, they just, they, it feels so good. And the whole time, God says, these things are an abomination to me. Now, does it matter? Well, yeah, it does. You talk about the creator of the universe says, this is an abomination to me. Well, God knows my heart. Certainly he does. That's why Genesis chapter 3 is because of your heart. Your heart was so corrupt that he had to kill over 9 billion people. So where would you get that figure? Well, if you take the mathematics from after the flood and the multiplication and you look at the history and see what conspires in a 2,000-year period and you conversely think and, 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 and just go, well, if it was that way before, then it's very possibly it could be the same way. And if there's 11 billion people up in you know, the first 2,000 years after I'm using a way too high figure of a number. I said 11 billion, didn't I? Yeah, I didn't mean that many. Nine billion. I'll stick with nine billion. And, and, and they lived for as long as they did. So, now you put that back. He, he wiped them all out except for eight. Eight people. 
the rest of them were gone. Because he knew their heart. And he tells us in the Tanakh and in the writings that our hearts are wicked above all things. Even the beloved Shaul, Paul, said the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I want to do, I don't do. Oh, oh, oh. I can see him in that cell talking to the guards. You just don't understand. I, I really want to. Oh, oh. He was passionate about his love for Messiah, and it bothered him immensely that his heart was so corrupt. Here's a guy that wrote 13, possibly 14 of the books of the Bredasha. Go preach you tonight. Good stuff. <laughs> so yes, we need to make sure that we examine and test. Now let me quickly go on. There's, uh, here, here's more. In, they're in your notes about the uh, gut questions. Then there's another place, and I, I do want to read this one real quick because it's just ugh, one of those that, that got on my skin. Joyfully Growing in Grace website. And, and, and it speaks of the Hebrew movement and their desire to be scripturally obedient and then, then writes on it and says some stuff. Let me read to you just very quickly um, what they say in this one here. I will as soon as I find it. It's in your sheet. That's why I can't find it. I have too much up here. It's too much I just wanted to say. Listen to this. So they're teaching here and they say, uh, speaking of Hebrew roots movement and their desire to be scriptural, obedient to following the things of scripture, they say this. It also never occurred to these folks, speaking of those of us that want to obey scripture, that God in his sovereign will chose a time when the Mediterranean world was under the rule of one state, the Roman Empire, whose engineering feats have made quick travel over long distance possible through its vast network of roads. The highly expressive Greek language was the common language for learning, and Hellenistic culture had greatly influenced much of the known world since Alexander the Great. The Greek language is highly suited for philosophical endeavors, whereas biblical Hebrew was relatively simple in comparison. I do not believe it was coincidence that God chose a time when the infrastructure, the language, the culture, and the empire allowed an easy expansion of the faith. Easy. Easy. He hung on a cross. That was easy. They drove nails in his hands. That was easy. See why I was yelling at my computer? I want to yell now. Oh! An easy expansion of faith. The widespread use of the language that allowed its uh, forceful defense and a rich culture that allowed it to be placed in the context of the fulfillment of all that is good within mankind. Mankind's so good. And they worked so hard to get everything ready so that when, when man got everything right, God could send his son. No! When God put everything in right order, his son came at the right time. Not because of anything that we did. Ooh. I'll say it again. We have nothing. Nothing. It is him alone. Period. Mm. Restricting the faith to some alleged Hebrew roots that define a faith other than whatever existed removes two of the great strengths of Christianity. And it talks about the two in the next slide, talks about that. One is universality. Is that what Messiah brought, was universality? No, he said, I've come to divide. Is it our historicity, our historical background? Is that what makes us? No. And so what these people are doing is they, they are Hellenizing everything and they are trying to say, oh, it's because of everything I did. You want me to tell you what? It doesn't matter one bit how ready I am. Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, is coming the second time when his Father has appointed the time and not because the world's ready for it. 
Because you know what? When he comes, the world isn't going to be ready for it. Because if we look back at Scripture, were the, was the, the, the body, the church, if you want to call it that, the, was the Messianic people, were, were the Jews ready for the Messiah when he came the first time? No! Most of the church didn't even recognize him. If Yeshua was to walk in most churches today, they would ask him to leave. Because they don't know him. You know why? They don't follow his instructions. They do as they please. I know I'm ranting and raving like they do. But I'm passionate about my love for my Messiah. And it is important how I live. It's important what I look like. If I walk out that door and I don't look any different than the world out there, if they don't see something different, maybe not necessarily in the way I look or the way I dress. If I don't have the mind of Christ, the verse that I gave you, Philippians chapters 2, verses 1 through 5, if I don't have that mindset, if I don't have what Yeshua taught in, in the, uh, what we call the, the Beatitudes in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, that righteous garment, if I'm not wearing that, I'm not representing my Messiah. I'm not of his household. I'm of something else. I'm sorry. An apple is an apple. A banana is a banana. A plum is a plum. And a dirt bag is a dirt bag. I don't care how nicely you dress him up. I started to say pig, but I wasn't sure if I should go. You can dress a pig up, but he's still a pig. And if I was to, I'm not going to say, because it's one of the, Object lessons I got in the near future with one of the lessons. But folks, understand, Hebrew roots is a title. And if you want to wear a title, wear a title that represents Yeshua. Wear a title that proclaims the name of the Father. And you have to know what his name is in order to wear that name. And I, I hate to even have to tell you, because most people will, well, who is he? The father is yod He wah Some say Yahweh. I like to say Yahweh. So I like, I like the way it sounds and much study that I've done. It's as close as we can come. There's others that are close but because it had been banned for so many years, we don't know how to say it. But that's my father. So when people want to know who my God is, I don't go, well, he's the God of the universe. And they go, well, my God's pretty special too. What's your God? And they will give me some other God's name. And, and most Christians go, uh, I know he's got a name. What is it? Uh, El Shaddai. No, no, no. That, that's not a name. El Elyon. Sounds good. No, no, that's not it. Well, Elohim, that's it, because that's in the first verse of the Bible, right? Elohim, in the beginning, Elohim, that's his name, right? No, it isn't. His name is Yahweh. And it was given to Moshe to tell the people that in the name of the Creator was coming the Redeemer, who is Yah, salvation, Yahweh, sends Yahshua. Our salvation. And so the name Yeshua is his Hebrew name. The world may not understand it. They understand it as Jesus. But we need to teach him that there's power in his name. And we need to use his name. And trust in it and believe in it. Because that's where our strength comes from. Nothing else. Because that's what scripture says. He says, call upon the name. When you call someone up on the phone and you dial, I pick up my phone and I was to dial Mike Desmond and I hit send, I don't expect for my son, Doc, to answer the phone. Why? I dialed Mike. Mike should be answering the phone because I'm calling on his name, not someone else's. If I call on Doc, I expect my son to answer the phone, not my daughter. You see, when we call on the name of the Father, we need to know who our Father is. When we call on the name of our Redeemer, our Messiah, our King, who is soon coming back for His bride, are you ready? 
You want to make sure you have the right name of the right returning Savior. I think it's important. Because that's what Scripture says. Well, so much philosophy has been mixed into religion. So much historicity to say, well, we've always done it this way. It must be right. Doesn't make it right. You have to go back to Scriptures. Well, there's dangerous grounds that we have to look at and make sure that we, we're reasoning as we're thinking through all this. That their reasoning and thinking is not parallel to Scriptures. So as we examine things, we always got to make sure, like the pen, if the pen is Scripture and this is what God wants, if we're not living up to that, then we're not following in pursuit. We need to be careful of generalizations and assumptions. They make a lot of assumptions about this. We make a lot of assumptions about them as well. We have to be fair on both sides. And so we must be careful. Bringing Yahweh down to our level instead of the Father bringing us to a level that He desires for, we have to be careful of that. We can't try to pull Him down. We must ask Him to bring us up to the level that He desires. And we're all at a different journey in our walk with Messiah. And some are going to be here, some are going to be here, some are going to be all the way. Some of you are just so close that, that when you whisper, uh, Yeshua is just so ever close to you. And I pray we all get to that point. Well, there's so much more I could get into. I'm just going to skip through them. You have them in your notes. Next week, we're going to be looking at, did Yeshua do away with the Old Testament? Well, we're going to be looking at Scripture after Scripture. You are going to be bombarded next week with a lot of Scripture as we walk through this. And we'll answer that question with a simple yes or no. But you will have enough evidence to, to know which side of the fence you're going to be on. 